Isaiah 7, 14. I titled the sermon, Emmanuel, God with us, which is our theme for the day. And it comes out of this verse and also in Matthew chapter 1. But before I read this, I want to just say a word about prophecy. Why, why are we so in awe of prophecy? And uh, this is how I would say it. The re- there's a reason that Bible prophecy is so legit. And here's what I want to do. I want to, I want to kind of Ponder this before we dig into this verse. So briefly here, come with me. Bible prophecy is more than just foretelling, okay? It is, it is foretelling or telling beforehand of God's foreordination of those events, okay? So God is not just wanting to be like, hey, let me impress you guys with what I can do. Um, he is revealing who he is, when he gives prophecy. He's saying, listen, is there anything too hard for me? Is there anything that I can't do? Is there anyone who can interrupt what I have purposed to do and will do in my good time and all my good pleasure will be accomplished? Can anyone interrupt that? And the answer is no. So it is the foretelling of God's foreordination. He tells us beforehand, not only so we'll know, but so we'll see him and trust him. Listen to the words of Isaiah in Isaiah 46. Boy, these are good verses to memorize. If you've yet to put these to memory, this would, this would be a great passage to memorize from Isaiah. This is, this is a commentary of God on prophecy and the way he works. Listen to what he says. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. Only God can do that. He declares it. This is what it will be. And then saying from ancient times things that are not yet done. So he says this is what is going to take place. In ancient times, way back here, and things take place exactly as he has said. Big things and small things. So if he, if he says, I, I want to call a bird of prey uh, from the east, I can do that. He says, I, I, I call a, uh, my counsel shall stand, I will accomplish all my purpose. I call a bird of prey from the east or the man of my counsel from a far country. He's, he's saying, listen, I do what I want. And no one is interrupting what I want. If I say I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. And the point is, you can trust me. That's that's the whole point of him telling us this. He's he's like, trust me. Trust me. When I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. So wait for me. Watch for me. It's going to happen. I have spoken, and I will bring it to pass. I have purposed, and I will do it. This is the commentary on prophecy. And so what we find when we open our Bibles and we find, you know, prophecy after prophecy after prophecy fulfilled is there is a faith-strengthening experience in that. When we read our Bibles and it says hundreds of years before it happens, this is what I'm going to do, and then God does it hundreds of years later. And you're like, well, Isaiah probably didn't understand the fullness of all he was writing at this point. The answer is, you're right. Neither did John when he wrote Revelation. But he wrote of things that are not yet, that haven't happened yet, but we know they will because God is so consistent in his fulfilling of prophecy. The work of Christ, both in his arrival, the way he came, the, 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 all of the details of his birth, both in Bethlehem, which by the way is so important, significant, uh, the journey from Nazareth down to Bethlehem, God moved them there to fulfill what he had purpose. That's exactly what he said he would do. And all of his work on the cross, his death, burial, resurrection, his ascension to the right hand of the Father, all of these things foretold by the prophets of old and fulfilled. God always keeps his word. That's what we are to conclude when we run into prophecy. He's trustworthy. Count on him. He's faithful. Maybe to say it this way, he's able. He's able. I think of Job in Job 42. No purpose of his can be thwarted. God does what he wants. There's there's nothing that he sets out to do and says, oh man, I just, 
I really want to do this, but I can't. I'm, I'm unable. Or I plan to do this, and I told you I would do this, but here's the deal. Things changed, and, you know, I'm not really into that anymore. No. God doesn't change. There's no shadow in Him due to change. He is a promise-keeping God. And when He says He's going to do something, He does it. And so, we come now then to the word of the Lord in the mouth of Isaiah. He raises up Isaiah to prophesy in a very challenging time for Israel. Um, and a little bit of a context here. King Ahaz is not a good king. He is a king who is filled with fear. The big question for this king is, will he trust God and fear God, or will he live in fear and fear man? Now, what's interesting is that's kind of our day too, isn't it? Oh, how powerful fear is. How overwhelming fear can be to paralyze us under the weight of all of these unknowns. What if? Well, what about this? And how easy it is to bow before the idol of safety and security. God calls his people to bow to him and not fear. He says, fear not, over and over in the scriptures. And so here, King Ahaz is acting in fear, and, and he's dealing with the Assyrians. These are a, a real enemy, and they are growing in strength. And the big question is, will the king fear God and obey him, or will he seek to cut a deal and negotiate with the Assyrians? This is old school, don't negotiate with the terrorists, right? It's never been a good idea, right? It's, it still isn't a good idea. What will King Ahaz do? Well, God graciously, lovingly sends Isaiah the prophet to bolster his faith in the Lord. But Ahaz, he fails tremendously to receive that. So, uh, the lead up to the whole of this is Isaiah is saying, listen, trust the Lord. And then, and then Ahaz is like, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking we can do this on my own. I, I got a plan. And, and he basically says, listen, Ask the Lord for a sign. Ask the Lord for a sign. See, he'll, he'll show you He is with you. He'll show you He is sovereign. You just make it as great as you want. You say, say something and, and, and God will show how powerful He is. He's here. And King Ahaz says, well, you know, I don't want to put the Lord to the test. And it sounds so sanctimonious, so righteous and pious, but it is faithless. It's a stiff arm of the prophet and the God of the prophet who was seeking to reassure the king. It reminds me of when Moses said this to the Lord. He said, if your presence, Lord, will not go with me, please don't bring us up from, my, from Sinai. We, we don't stand a chance. If you are not Emmanuel with us, what are we to do? This is a godly response. This is the kind of faith we are to have. Apart from you, we can do nothing. If you are not with us, we're dead meat. That's what King Ahaz should be saying, but friends, he was inclined to take matters into his own hands and do what he thought would fix the problem. So God says, listen, I'm going to give you a sign anyway. And through Isaiah comes our verse. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, that is an amazing verse. What we find, and we find this often in biblical prophecy, is that there are double fulfillments of this. There's a partial fulfillment in its historical context, but then there is what you call an ultimate fulfillment many times in Christ, in the gospel. So, when Isaiah says this to King Ahaz, he's likely pointing at a woman, uh, I would say most likely his future wife, and saying, this one right here will conceive and bear a son. Now, in, in the immediate context, that's with Isaiah. She's childless. She's not even married yet, but I'm going to marry her. We're going to have a, a child. It's going to be a son, a son. And by the time he is old enough to choose evil, to know what is right from wrong, the Assyrians are coming. Judgment. Judgment. So the sign in its immediate context was a sign of God's judgment upon Ahaz and Israel. Now, 
Was that birth a virgin birth? No, it was not. He was pointing, I think, to a woman who was a virgin at the time, but then would be married and conceive with Isaiah, I think, and have a child. But the fullness of this prophecy happens when the virgin conceives, the virgin Mary, conceives by the Holy Spirit and bears a son who is the son of God and calls his name Emmanuel. In the immediate context, even in God's judgment, God was saying, I am with you. But in the fullness of Matthew 1, where where this comes together, God is saying, I am with you in the flesh, in Christ, in person. I've sent my son to be with you. Okay, now let's build this out as we go from here. The fullness of this prophecy is a supernatural sign. The idea of a a virgin conception, who even comes up with this? Only God. Who can do this? Only God. There has never been in the history of mankind a woman who has been impregnated by the Holy Spirit, but Mary. He has chosen Mary, looked upon her with grace, with favor, and she is the mother now of the Son of God, the Messiah. A display of God's power, is anything too hard for me? Shall, shall anything be too hard for the Lord? He purposes to do things sometimes in ways that leave no wiggle room. Like Abraham and Sarah. Oh yeah, well that was just normal. No, they were old when they had Isaac. There's no way that could have happened. But for God. That's his point. And the miraculous conception and birth of Jesus is the same. It is also an undeserved gift of God's love, of God's love, His grace and goodness. 700 years before the birth of Christ, Isaiah said these words. (laughs) That's, That's awesome. I mean, think of that. 700 years. Isaiah, when he said these words, probably had no inclination to the fullness of the messianic voice that he was speaking from the Lord and how God would bring this to pass 700 years later in Jesus Christ. The name he should be given is Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now, it can be spelled either with an I or an E. The I in Emmanuel points us back to the Hebrew. The E points us to the Septuagint, which is the the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Either way is fine. I like the I. No, No worries, okay? No offense. Kathy likes the I too. I think we had a long conversation years ago. We're, we're on the team I, okay? Either one is fine. The point is that it means, it means something significant. God with us. Now, why is that a big deal? Why is that so precious to us? Why, why the name Emmanuel given to the, the Christ child? Well, let me tell you the story of God with us in four scenes, okay? So we're going to start at the first page of your Bible and we're going to finish with the last page of your Bible and I promise you it won't be too long, okay? But you've already eaten, so I get more time, right? (laughs) Just joking. Four scenes, the story of God with us, the story of Emmanuel. Let's start in the garden. Intimacy, the intimacy of the garden. Genesis chapter 1 Verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Okay, let's be clear. I say this often. From the very first chapter in your Bible, it's not hard to discern how many genders there are. Two, male and female. This is not complicated. And they are created by God as beautiful, designed by him, distinct, male, female, good. That is of God. It's no surprise that the enemy doesn't like that and seeks to twist it up. It's not complicated. It's very clear. He blessed them and he said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth. Here's command. Command. Subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. This is the first marriage. It is involving one man and one woman. Marriage is God's idea. It's His institution. He created it. He blessed it. He called it good. He assigned it to Adam and Eve. And He then 
sent them out to do what he had called and created them to do. He steps back in verse 31 and he says, he looks over all that he had made and he says, behold, it was very good. Not just good. It wasn't just enough to say good. It was very good. Oh, friends, how awesome that intimacy with God was. They experienced this image of God that he had imprinted upon them. We have been made in the image of God, which means we are mirrors. We, are, we exist as mirrors to reflect his glory. Sin is the opposite of that. It's when we take the mirror and shatter it and turn it on ourselves and make it all about us. We have been made for his glory, made in his image, not the other way around. God doesn't exist in our image. We exist in his Think of the unity they had. Union with God. No sin. No separation. No awkward pauses because of, of, of shame or guilt. Total intimacy. Both with God and with one another. No marital disputes. No, no night where you just can't figure out how to resolve this and then you're just like, fine, I guess we'll deal with it tomorrow. No, none of that. Union. Harmony. Peace. Shalom. Shalom. Also, union with creation. There was not this at odds, this fierce, fallen experience of a harsh earth. It was beautiful. And they enjoyed the garden. They were given all of the plants and trees. They were to rule over all of the animals in the the water and on the land. And they were to eat of all the trees except for one. One tree was withheld. That's not hard. It's not like they were lacking food. Hmm. But that one tree became a major problem. The command of God was a test of obedience and loyalty. Will you trust me? Will you trust me? Will you trust me? The answer we gave is no. No. In Adam, we all died. We all sinned. We collectively sinned in Adam The isolation of sin then becomes scene two for the story of God with us. This is why we long for God to be with us because He is not with us. He is against us because of this rebellion. Listen to how this goes. They ate of the fruit and their eyes were opened. They knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And when we went through this book years ago, I pointed out, just if you find yourself in this situation ever, don't use a fig leaf. Like, that's the worst leaf to you. You talk about uncomfortable, terribly awkward, not the leaf to choose. That is in itself a depiction of God's curse upon them, that they chose fig leaves. Now listen to this. They heard the sound of the Lord walking, the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And sometimes people will, commentators will say, this points us to the idea that that this was a normal experience, that they loved to do this. They would share this this walk through the garden with the Lord and however that worked, whether it was a a manifestation of His glory or or maybe a theophany, a pre-incarnate revelation of the Son there in the the garden walking. But this time He's coming and he's, He's walking in the garden. But instead of running to Him, what did they do? The man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man. I often picture a parent playing hide and seek with a child who's right there, hiding with his eyes closed. You know, God's not wondering where they went, but he's engaging them. Where are you? And Adam said, I heard the sound. He like pokes his head out from behind the tree. I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. God replies, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The Lord knows. He's getting straight at the heart of the issue. Sin and separation followed. The Lord pronounced a curse upon the man, upon the woman, and upon the serpent. All of creation was subjected to futility and has been groaning ever since. It's the reason why 
Sin has never been hard for us. <laughs> it is our autopilot. We were born is in sin, spiritually lifeless and dead, haters of God by auto instinct. It's, it's in us. It's what we do. We have been separated from God because He's holy. We don't have God with us. We have God, as I said, against us in His anger and His wrath because we are rebels and haters of God. He is required by His righteousness to oppose everything that we are. And He will do so all the way to the fires of hell, eternally so. He doesn't owe us anything but justice. Remember this, friends. Oh, in our day, we need more of this, don't we? All of this mamby-pamby, lovey-dovey stuff, what makes that amazing is that God is righteously indignant at sinners. He owes us nothing but hell forever. If we longed for God with us without something else in the equation, it would be fire forever. He must meet us in His justice in order to defend His holiness. We are the rebels. We are the haters. We have rejected Him. We stiff arm Him. We rail against Him. Friends, that is the bad news. That's, it's, it's devastating. That's why when you turn on the news, it's such a train wreck out there in the world. That's what's wrong. We don't need redistribution. We need repentance. That's what we need. Curse and corruption, devastation and death. In that moment, Adam and Eve begin to fade to the dirt from which God made Adam. They begin to die. They died spiritually instantly. They began to die physically and they were buried. As God said, they would be. Hmm. However, there's a glimmer of hope even in the pronouncement of God's curse. When he's addressing Satan, the serpent, that deceiver, he pronounces a curse upon the serpent, and this is the first prophecy, the first messianic prophecy in your Bible. Here it comes. I will put enmity, Satan, between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring, he, he, capital H, he shall bruise your head, Satan, and you shall bruise his heel. That was fulfilled on the cross of Christ. He will crush your head, Satan. Sure, the cross is coming. It will be a bruise, but only on his heel as he stomps you to death and disarms you, triumphing over you in the cross. So it points us to number three, the wonder of the incarnation. The intimacy of the garden, which gives way to the devastation, the isolation of sin, and now the wonder of the incarnation. Friends, this is why Christmas is so awesome. This is why it's all about Jesus. The, the whole focal point of this is, is He came near and we didn't deserve it. It's a gift of His love. The wonder the amazing experience of God's grace. Listen to Matthew 1. Now, just to set this up. 400 years of silence. God has not given any revelation for 400 years. After the prophets were done speaking, he, he shut the door, and all the people heard for 400 years was silence. And then hope breaks in upon the arrival of of this Christ child. Matthew chapter 1, now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a just man, unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. Oh, so much culturally is happening here that we don't conceive of it. First of all, betrothal was the same as engagement, only it was far more serious. It, like they were engaged such that in order to break that off, it's not a text, it's not an email or a meeting. It's divorce. Like you have to divorce in order to break off a betrothal. This was an arranged thing. It was agreed upon. 
and they were in a period of waiting where Joseph was preparing his place and then he was going to come and get Mary upon the agreed time to be his wife. During that period of time, she, it says, was found to be with child, which means scandal. Scandal of scandals. She should not be with child. They are not fully married. They are only betrothed. So, the fingers would begin to point. Well, I think it was his fault. I think it was her fault. Who has she been with that all of this drama began to unfold in Nazareth? Her husband, Joseph, was a righteous, a just man, and he cared for Mary. He didn't want to publicly shame her or throw her under the bus. And so he said, you know, I, I'm just going to divorce her quietly. This was the most gracious way to deal with the situation. He had to defend his own honor as a righteous and just man, but he also cared for her. So he's wrestling with this and struggling. What do I do? How do I understand this? As he considered these things, wrestled with these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David. That's big. That's big. You realize the genealogy that led up to this. Matthew chapter 1 was a Davidic genealogy that tracked all the way down to Joseph. Guess who was in that genealogy, friends? King Ahaz, the son of David. Joseph, son of David. Here's some words. Do not fear. We're already seeing connections to Isaiah chapter 7, aren't we? Do not fear. Fear not. It's one of the most often repeated commands in your Bible. Don't fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And the angel goes on. But I, I'm like, if I'm Joseph, I'm like, uh, question. Um, <laughs> what? That which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. I have no reference point but Isaiah 7.14. I, I don't know what you're talking about. How is that possible? The first believer in Jesus Christ was Joseph. Isn't that amazing? He believes the angel when the angel says, this is a supernatural conception. She will bear a son, not just a child, a son, a son. Also drives us back to Isaiah 7, 14. And you shall call his name, and all of us together want to say, Emmanuel, don't we? Right? That's what Isaiah said. Why would the angel get it wrong? Why would the angel say, name him Jesus? Now all of a sudden we have a problem, don't we? Is this a contradictory issue? Did the Bible confound you? Is it, is it fighting this text? No, it's not. And Matthew sees it exactly the, the same as we should. For he will save his people from their sins. That's the meaning of Jesus, the name Jesus. He goes on. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. All of it. Behold, and then he quotes. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Jesus. <laughs> I'm messing with you. It's right. It's, it's, he says Emmanuel, which means God with us. God with us. There's our theme. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not. There's that word I mentioned a few weeks ago. Knew her. Like he didn't just know about her. This is a level of love and intimacy. He didn't engage with her sexually until she had given birth to a son. So it was a virgin conception, a virgin birth, and he called, he called, not she, he called his name Jesus in obedience to the, to the angel. This was adoptive moments here for Joseph, by the way, who was not Jesus' father by blood. He was his father, Davidic father, by adoption. And on the eighth day, after Jesus was circumcised, his name was bestowed by his father as the angel commanded. Jesus became Joseph's son legally at that point, even though he was a child who was uh, uh, implanted or woven in by the Holy Spirit in Mary's womb. Lots to see here. But let's figure out this name thing. I had to dig a little bit to understand why is this synonymous for Matthew, but it seems different for us. 
Jesus, this is the name we call him, the name we love, the name above every name, right? It, it goes back to, in the Old Testament, Joshua or Yeshua, which the root of that is Yeh, which points us to Yahweh, the Lord, and Isha, which means to save or to rescue. It's the verb of, uh, of this. And when you put them together, you get Yeshua. When you say that, uh, translate it into English, it's Jesus. It's Jesus means Yahweh saves. He saves. Specifically, he saves from sin. That's an important note. I'll say more on that in a second. So Joseph bestows the name to this Christ child. He bestows on him the name Jesus or Joshua, Yeshua. And it means he saves from sin. He will save his people from their sins. The difference here, though, is that Jesus, in his very essence, as the Christ child, embodies the name Emmanuel. It fits. It fits. People didn't go around calling Jesus Emmanuel by his his name. Just like Adam, when he named his wife woman because she was taken out of the womb, he, he said she shall be called woman, but he, just a couple verses later, he calls her Eve, right? That's, that's her name, but she is in the embodiment of woman, okay? So you see this in a variety of ways. In fact, our call to worship, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace, or even in our closing song, desire of nations, uh, key of David, root of Jesse, all of the names that come to mind of Jesus. They all are true of him because of his role, his purpose, his, his embodiment of all that they represent. So, they called his name Jesus, and in his being there, he fulfilled God with us. This is a very hope-filled moment for sinners the world over. For all those who by faith anticipated the arrival and work of the Messiah, Old Testament, and for all of us here who celebrate the work of the Messiah, His arrival and His work on the cross. Listen to how John puts it in John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word. That's another name for Jesus. The Word, or the, the second member of the Godhead, the Son. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's another way of speaking His divinity. He was in the beginning with God. He's not created, right? He had no beginning. Trinitarian display. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Not only when he, was He there in the beginning, but it says all things were made through Him. So the Father created all things through the Son. So when you read in Genesis, let there be, guess who's talking? The Son. Let there be, let there be, let there be. That is our Savior who's speaking words. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. It's another way of saying He made everything. And then He says, In Him was life, and the light was the light of men. And then here comes God with us. Here comes Emmanuel. Verse 14, And the Word, the Son, became flesh, incarnate, the incarnation, and dwelt among us, tabernacled among us. He lived among us. And it was glorious. We have seen His glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. What an epic way to describe the Christmas event, the arrival of Jesus. It's always important to see the manger With the shadow of the cross, the point of the manger always is the cross. He has a mission. The mission of God with us, Emmanuel, is to save from sin. Listen to these verses. She will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now, in this day, the people were so stuck on politics they were, they were hating the Romans. They were overwhelmed with this occupying force. They wanted a deliverer, and they attached all of that 
to the messianic hope. Someday we're going to have a king and he's going to deal with these crazy Romans and he's going to put down an iron fist and he's going to conquer and he's going to sit on the throne of David and we will be free. Well, all of that is true, but far, far bigger than that. Jesus did not come to overthrow the Romans. He came to overthrow sin and Satan and all of death itself. It's way bigger than politics. And friends, let's just be aware, that inclination is echoing still in our day. What we have in Christ is far more than some political you know, solution. Jesus is the king of the nations. So we have to be careful not to fall into some kind of a, you know, messianic uh, Christian nationalism. Jesus is a savior of sinners the world over. And we delight in him that way. The problem is, is when he came, the people of his day, they were like, well, where's the politics? Where's the throne? Where's the beat up the Romans? And yay, Hosanna turned into crucify. Just like that. His mission was always clear of old to save His people from their sins. God with us looks like this. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish. Why would we perish? Because we rebelled. Because we hate God. Because God is against us. Rightfully so. He's holy. But through His Son, we can experience His love, His grace, His forgiveness. And eternal life. We can live with Him forever. Hmm. Jesus, our Emmanuel, my friends, is our only hope of rescue from the wrath of God. This, this needs to be more proclaimed in our day. I, I, I love that Christ has come and that He is a Savior, but friends, Savior from what? That's what needs to be emphasized too. He saves us from God from the wrath of God, from a righteous judge who cannot simply look the other way to our sin and our rebellion, and he won't. He will either bury you in wrath or he will pour that wrath on his son who died for you on the cross. His wrath must be satisfied. Oh, the the incarnation is good news. It's good news even in Isaiah. Think of Isaiah 53. Listen to the the atonement focus of Messiah. Surely He, that is the Son, that is Emmanuel, that is Jesus, has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed, esteemed Him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. You, you see what He's saying? The whole point is the cross is a place of expiation. It's where the Father poured the full cup of wrath that I deserve to receive. He poured it on His Son. He was crushed for our iniquities and upon Him was the chastisement that brought us peace. By His stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to His own way. We know that. That's instinctual to us all. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Think of that. He drank the very last drop of wrath for you so that you won't have to taste of that at all. Hmm. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Oh, our world would like to suggest that there's a lot of ways to be saved. A lot of paths to God. Some people think that I can be good enough to try to deserve God's forgiveness. The Bible answers that with a resounding, that's not going to happen. That that is impossible. Try jumping the Grand Canyon. It's not going to happen. You may jump a little ways, but you're still going to fall to your death. You can never be good enough. That's the point of the Old Testament. That's the point of the law. Some people think that there are other saviors, others out there that can kind of vouch for you or something. Not true. Not true. Either Jesus is speaking truth here or he's a liar. 
He said, it's me, and that's it. There's no other way to the Father except through me. Exclusive salvation. Hmm. Don't call that, don't suggest that there are multiple ways to God and call that tolerance. Don't, don't fall prey to that and think that you're loving anyone. In a world filled with quote-unquote tolerance, the one Savior who is the hope is not tolerated. I found that kind of ironic. It's actually satanic. It's no surprise. There is only one way to be saved if you're a sinner. This Jesus, as they preach in the New Testament just after uh, the ascension, this Jesus who was rejected by you, the builders, has become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Where do you stand with Jesus, the Christ child, the King, God with us, Emmanuel? Where do you stand with Him today? Now, the good news is that there are more promises that have yet to be fulfilled. There are prophecies that have yet to be accomplished. But what do we know, friends? What do we know? <laughs> we know that God does what He says. It's going to happen. It's just a matter of time. So I want to close by taking us to the end of your Bible. At the very end, the promise of our Emmanuel. Listen to John 14 as he sets this up. Jesus saying, If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. He says, I'm coming again. I'm coming back. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you, he says in verse 18. I love that. I'm not deserting you. I'm not leaving you out on your own. I'm coming back. And while I'm gone, the Holy Spirit will be with you. For the Lord Himself, Paul writes, will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel and the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. That is, all those who have embraced Jesus as their Savior and Lord and have died, Old Testament and New. Anyone who looks to Jesus with faith and says, you are my only hope, save me from my sins, who passes away, their bodies are laid to rest, their souls are immediately with the Lord, but upon His return, their bodies will break forth out of the ground and be reunited with their souls. And then we who are left, who are alive, if He comes back and we're still here, guess what? We're blowing the roof off this joint. We're out of here. We're going straight up and look at what we're going to do. We will be together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. The Lord, our Emmanuel. And so, I love these words, we will always be with the Lord. God with us is our destiny. We with Him. He with us. This is what we were made for in the garden. It's what we've lost with our chosen sin and rebellion. It's what we've been graciously bestowed upon and given in salvation. And it is what our future is. All of it is God with us. That's our destiny. So Revelation 21, 3, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. Oh, this is awesome. The God with us reality. He will dwell with them, and they will be His people, and God Himself will be with them as their God. Wow. You long for that when you watch the news? Do you long for that when you look in the mirror? You see your own sin, you see your frailty, you feel the weakness. And we just had people go through tough surgeries this week. Dean Crosswhite was sitting right here in the first service. He went through some really intense stuff. And here he is, and he told me after church, he's like, that is my focus. That's the focus of my life, is Jesus, to walk with him. He said when I was under surgery, all I was doing was talking with him. Praise God. God is with us, and he's coming to be with us face to face, in person, in the flesh. So the last chapter, the last page of your Bible says this. He who testifies to these things says, that's Jesus, surely I am coming soon. Be ready, right? Be ready. And we say, 
Let it be, Lord. Amen to that. Maranatha, here's our cry. Here's our longing. Come, Lord Jesus. Come. Come. You find yourself just crying that out? Groaning those words? Come, Lord Jesus. That is the story of God with us. It starts in the garden. It goes through all hell and brokenness and shattered mess. That's our doing. And then the work of redemption in all its fullness. That's the bulk of your Bible. And the final chapters show the future glory. God with us forever. So our response this morning. We're going to close this service by singing these words. O come, O come, our God with us, our Emmanuel. O come, O come, Emmanuel. That is our great longing at Christmas. We talk about Advent and the anticipation of the Old Testament and all of the prophets awaiting the arrival of the Christ child. But friends, we're still in Advent, aren't we? We are waiting for His return. Today, we wait. We wait for His return. And so we cry, O come, O come, Emmanuel. And I was struck as I thought about those words, why do we say, O? Why do we say, O there? The O is an expression of our longing for all things to be made right. The O is an expression of our love to see Him face to face, to look into His eyes and behold the One who died for us The O is a longing for all of this mess to be made right. And so we will live happily ever after. Where did that originate? Oh, the end of every good story points us back to the end of the story of the world. O come, O come, Emmanuel. So just a question in closing then. As Christmas is upon us, what do you long for most? The Christmas tree, kids, the Christmas tree exists because of this tree. That's what it's all about. Why is it green? Why is it in your house? It's a reminder. He is not dead. He is alive. He gives life. It is an evergreen because he will never fade. Now that tree you have, that's going to be dropping needles real soon, right? Not our tree because it's fake. Don't tell anybody. The evergreen is in your house and it is filled with memories, the ornaments, graces of God, memories of His sustaining grace, His answers to prayer. Think of all of the different ornaments and their meanings that you hang on your tree. The lights, we owe that to Martin Luther. He added light to the tree because Jesus is the light of the world. It's a lot safer nowadays than it used to be when they had real candles on their cut down trees. The presence around the tree, gifts, the gifts of God's grace, the free gift of salvation. We will all gather at the foot of this tree someday, grateful. The ground is level there. No one deserves to be there. It's all a gift of His grace. So we give gifts to others because we've received the greatest gift He could ever give, and that is His Son, Jesus, our Emmanuel, God with us. If you're here and the thing you're most excited about for Christmas is stuff, then let me call you from the fog and darkness of a materialistic culture to something far more satisfying than a bread maker. I was was knocking on the bread maker in the first service and I started feeling bad because probably someone here bought one and they're about to open it. It's still awesome. You just won't use it that much. (laughs) What do you long for most? Most likely, my friends, what your heart longs for most has a name. His name is Yeshua. Jesus. His name is Emmanuel. God with us. He is the gift of all gifts. And it's my longing that you will embrace Him as your Lord, your Savior, your hope alone in this life and the next. Turn from your sins. Why rebel any longer? Oh, it's a hard way to live. Come be free and forgiven. Embrace Jesus as Lord and Savior and King, treasure of all treasures. Let's pray.
O come, O come, Emmanuel. We delight in You today. You are the One who saves, the only One who saves from sin and death and darkness and Satan. We delight in You, Jesus, our King, our Lord, our Savior, our hope, our joy, our friend. We make much of You today. O oh, Jesus, thank You for Your obedience to Your Father. This mission required of You tremendously to come in humility, to take upon Yourself that which You created with Your words, to carry flesh and, and to, to do so perfectly, to live with no sin in a world that is just drenched in sin. Thank You for Your willingness to set Your face to go to Jerusalem and die the death that I deserve to die because of my sin and rebellion. But You took my place and You died my death and You paid for my sins in full. Jesus, thank You. Thank You that You were humbled enough to die all the way down, all the way to be buried in the grave. And then, after three days, victory, triumph over sin and Satan, death and hell. We delight in You, Jesus, our Savior, and we cry, oh, come, come again. We can't wait to see You again. We can't wait to see You set this right, this dark world lit up by the light of You. Come, Lord Jesus, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.